Jane Goodall, welcome to our show, and thank you so much for making time for us this morning. Um, first of all, were you surprised by the outbreak of the coronavirus? No, not really, because it's been predicted for many, many, many years, and we paid no attention to the lessons we should have learned from SARS and MERS and HIV and all the others. We just didn't listen and, I suppose, put our heads in the sand and said, well, carry on, business as usual, never mind. What should have been the lessons that we should have learned from those earlier outbreaks? Well, all of them, the ones I'm talking about, are the so-called zoonotic diseases. That's diseases that have crossed the species barrier from animals to humans. And so that's happened because we've been destroying the habitats. Animals have come closer and closer to each other. Viruses have jumped from one species to another. And then they've been pushed into closer contact with people. And then also we've been hunting them, killing them, eating them, trafficking them, uh, putting them in contact with all kinds of different species from all over the world in some of these meat wildlife markets, meat markets. And so it's not surprising that the conditions are being created that viruses spread. And that's why we've got this pandemic. Are you then saying that it's, that it's sort of man-made, that we are responsible for this whole outbreak, for the mayhem that we are living in now? Yes, I'm not saying we're responsible every time a virus jumps from one species to another, but we've exacerbated it to such an extent that we've got this pandemic. We've had them before, but now that we've got all this media and the ability to do so, it's turned into a very frightening thing because people watch the every day to see how many people have died, how many people are infected. And uh, well, I think people can see the kind of thing I'm talking about in those shots that were just shown. We, um, you were talking about the wet markets, and, and we all know that this started in Wuhan, in China. Now, wet markets are, are a common thing in, uh, in Asia. You have them in Bangkok, uh, in, in Hong Kong. Is there still a serious threat that this could start all over again with a new virus, because these wet markets and these animals cropped up in close quarters are still there being sold? Well, the thing is that most wet markets don't sell wild animals. That's just a few. Most of them are similar to the farmers markets in Europe and America. And it's where most people go to buy fresh food at a reasonable price. And you can't just close down wet markets. But what has is happening is closing down the wildlife markets. And also, we should apply this to the intensive factory farms as well. Not just wild animals, but the way we treat pigs and cattle and chickens, because some diseases have started from those horrible operations as well. Um, you have been working extensively in Africa, naturally. Everybody knows your project in Gombe Park in Tanzania with the chimpanzees. How worried are you for a massive outbreak of this virus in Africa? Terribly worried. And they say it's coming. They say, you know, it's, it's later than everywhere else, but it's creeping up. You know, my grandchildren are in Dar es Salaam and the numbers there are, are creeping up. And then, of course, chimpanzees will be susceptible. They're very susceptible to uh, respiratory diseases. And how do we protect them? We're going to do our best. We're collecting up equipment to give the staff. We've reduced most of the staff. But they're so like us with their DNA that they're very susceptible. And, you know, we can look after them in our sanctuaries, and we are doing. But out in the wild, I mean, there's no borders, no boundaries. Are you saying that, that COVID-19 can go from humans to the chimps, for example, in the park that, that you love so dearly? Almost certainly, yes. The answer is almost certainly yes. Like Ebola can go from apes to people and back again. So uh, how worried are you for, for the chimpanzees then? Um, I mean, could your whole project, your life work, could that be destroyed by this situation? I don't think it would be totally destroyed because I, it wouldn't kill every chimp, just as it doesn't kill every human. But it's 
it's a nightmare because it's a very unpleasant disease. We can't treat the sick chimpanzees. Yes, I'm very worried. Um, what to do? Can you do anything? Because you're locked up like everybody in your house now in England. Have you got any means or instruments to protect your projects? Well, yes, because in all the projects, the staff are still working. And they've, you know, they've uh, uh, agreed and offered to stay on, on the spot. So they all get tested. They're given masks and uh, they have sterilized clothing each day. Only one or two go in the forest just to check on the health of the chimps. And also a big campaign to educate the people in the villages living around the national park. But it's a very, very difficult thing. And of course, we have to raise more, more funds for this unexpected, this, and, this really unexpected outbreak. Well, uh, talking about that, raising more funds, I mean, the Jane Goodall Institute, your institute is raising funds, but is that uh, still happening now? Or are people completely not concentrated or focused on nature and your projects? No, actually, people have been extremely generous. People joined us because they care about nature and wildlife. And obviously, some people who donated can no longer do so. But other people can and do and are. And we're extremely grateful to them. And, you know, the other thing is this all ties in with climate change, the destruction of the forests and the pollution of the land. It's all interconnected. And the sooner we realize this, I just pray and hope that we emerge from this pandemic, as we will, we always do, as better, wiser people. Yes. And I think there's millions of people in the in inner cities who probably have this wonderful experience of breathing clean air, looking up and seeing the stars at night because the pollution's gone away. And I just pray there's enough of them to make a groundswell of people who are just going to push business and politics into doing the right thing. You, you paint it like this is a silver lining of the crisis, but in the meantime, we, we are cutting trees on a massive scale in the Amazon. We kill anima, animals or cage them, like you were talking about the wet markets. We disrupt ecosystems and we shake those viruses loose from natural hosts. How do you stay optimistic in, in this climate? Because more and more people are understanding what's happened. I read every day about people saying, this is a wake up call. We have to rethink our relationship with the natural world. Also, there's all of our young people in our Roots and Shoots program that you know about. It's all over the Netherlands. And they're determined to make this a better world. And they understand. And as, as I say, the animal, the wildlife markets have been closed down. In China, Vietnam, Laos, various other places. So that's the hope that we will learn. But unfortunately, we have many political leaders who will be anxious to get back to business as usual, in fact, double it to make up for lost time. That's the fear. And there's nothing I can do about that. We, um, we were walking in December last year on the Utrechtse Heuvelweg, uh, you and I together, which was a nice uh, day. It was cold, though. But uh, I interviewed you during this walk, and you told me, uh, it, it, talking about climate cr uh, crisis, it's... Um, almost five to 12. We don't have a lot of time anymore to fix this problem. Could this be the game changer, Corona? Well, that's the hope, that it's the game changer. I mean, we've seen all around the world that this stopping of industry, temporary shutting down, uh, has cleared the skies. And that's probably given nature a big boost, you know. And in a way, we could look at this this pandemic and the hurricanes and the flooding and the droughts and the fires, as nature saying, hey, people, wake up. You can, can't go on doing this. I'm stronger than you are in the end. Yeah. Um, you are in your home in the UK. Uh, you are locked up. You are in your 80s. Are you afraid for this um, coronavirus? No, not in the slightest. 
I mean, I lived through World War II. I was in New York at 9-11. I've been in Africa where there have been soldiers with guns, a couple of bodies. And I've lived through all of those. Everybody's going to die one day. If I catch corona and die, well, okay, then sooner than I might have wished. But but we're the six of us in the house. It's my family home. It's where I grew up. The books behind me are the books I read as a child. And, you know, I'm in the right place. I'm working as hard as I can to reach as many people as possible. I'll go on doing my bit. And if I, you know, pop off, well, bye-bye, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> well, we hope that's not going to happen soon. Uh, these are the last minutes of this show today on this lovely uh, sunny Sunday in the Netherlands. I hope you have the same weather there. What would be the, the best message of hope that you could give our viewers today? What do you hope will be the best outcome out of all of this? The best outcome is that we turn the corner and move towards a more rational way of living and reduce our overconsumption, try to alleviate poverty, and above all, respect, respect each other, respect nature, respect the animals. If we do that, it will be a better world. And I can only hope and pray that something like a virus gets into some of these politicians who don't seem to listen to that message and twists their brains around. <laughs> I don't know that it will, but that's... And also to r remind everybody, every day each one of us lives, wherever we are, we can do something to make the world a better place. Jane Goodall, thank you so much for your time today. I wish you a long, pleasant, happy life. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. I've had one. <laughs>